Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Mike Lee from Utah. It's so nice and so rare to be close, so close to Capitol Hill and yet so in America. Thank you. <laughs> you know, this has been an interesting journey that we've been on the last few years. Um, I, I've been here now for three years. I was elected to the Senate in 2010 at the age of 39. I was reading at the late age of 40, and uh, they told me that was very impressive, but. Uh, not everyone was that impressed. When I showed up, a lot of the security guards didn't recognize me as a senator. They thought I looked a little bit more like a, a junior staffer or something. And, and I'm a teetotaling kid from Utah. I'm not used to getting carded. Um, <laughs> when I showed up to vote uh, in the Senate, I was frequently greeted by these heavily armed gentlemen who would stop me and say, excuse me, sir, the door for staff is over there. And um, I respond well to authority, so I would always produce my identification. I'll even show you. This is my senator card. It says, um, United States Senator representing Utah. It has my picture on it. It has my name. It says, expiration January 3rd, 2017. Sounds ominous. Wondered whether that's when I personally expire. I don't know. <laughs> but they would look at it. They would examine it, uh, uh, make sure the um, tamper-resistant strip was intact and that I had not, in fact, purchased it from a fake ID outlet in Georgetown. <laughs> then when they would uh, look at each other, shrug their shoulders, and say, well, I, I guess we have to let them in. And uh, you know, after I had been through this a number of times, I discovered that there was a shortcut to that ritual. And I discovered this lapel pin that they had given me when they swore me in. I promptly put it in my desk drawer and forgot about it. But I guess they make these things so that the Capitol Hill security will recognize you as a senator, and then you don't have to get carded. So I, I've discovered that this works pretty well most of the time. When I get carded, I just point to the pin, and they say, sorry, Senator, you can come on in. So I call it my sorry, Senator pin for that reason. <laughs> it works like a charm most of the time. Every t once in a while, it fails. Uh, one time after I had been there quite a while, I was on the floor of the Senate in between a couple of votes. I was leaning gently against the desk in front of me, thinking about how the next vote was going to turn out, one of the non-uniformed security personnel came up to me and said in a very harsh tone of voice, excuse me, sir, will you please not lean on the senator's desk? <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, I didn't realize I was putting any weight on it. It won't happen again. You see, they're really, really skittish about these desks. They're very protective. Some of these desks are about 200 years old, almost as old as some of my colleagues. And at that point, the uh, gentleman said to me, are you with the minority? And I said, what, what do you mean? I, uh, on this vote or the next, I don't always vote with my party. I guess I do a lot of the time, but sometimes my party gets it wrong. And he said, no, are, are you with the minority leader? And I said, I, I don't really understand what you mean. Mitch McConnell's our minority leader. Uh, uh, of course he's our leader. And uh, I still don't know whether you mean, am I with him on this vote or the next one? And he said, no, are you part of the minority leader's staff? And only then did I realize, oh, that's why he was so upset about the desk thing. Uh, I said, OK, I, and I, I just pointed to the, sorry, Senator Pinn, blank stare. It didn't do a darn bit of good. So I had to actually use my title. I didn't like doing that, still don't, not terribly comfortable doing it. So I mumbled it. I said, no, I, I'm Senator Lee. What? My name is Mike Lee. I represent a state called Utah. It's sort of squarish. It resembles a chair. It's in the Rock Mountains, lovely skiing. And then and only then did the guy realize that I had the right to be there, and he had sort of uh, you know, gone after me, not realizing I was a senator. And at that point, all the color drained from his face, and he said, in one hurried breath, I'm terribly sorry. My name is Steve, if you want to report me. And then he ran for the door. <laughs> I felt bad for Steve. I didn't want him to beat himself up over it. So I, I tried to chase after him. He was too fast. And so now, every time I pass Steve in the hall, I wave to him, I smile, I say, hi, Steve, just so he knows there are no hard feelings. This could happen to anyone. And only recently did it occur to me, his name's probably not Steve. <laughs> yeah. 
pretty sure it's Bob. Steve's a guy he works with that he doesn't like. You know, <laughs> you know had, had, um, had I, I, I not asserted my right to be there that day, I might have found myself being hauled off in handcuffs, and a few of my colleagues might, for their own entertainment, entertainment have, have simply allowed that to happen, waiting a few minutes before telling them, oh, that, that's, uh, he's okay to be here. But had I not asserted my right to do that, I might have missed the opportunity to vote. I might have lost something that uh, was properly mine to assert, but more importantly, lost something that I was supposed to be asserting on behalf of the three million people that I represent in my home state. And sometimes we have to do that sort of thing, not just as senators, but as citizens. We have certain rights that are ours, certain rights that we were born with as American citizens, the right to live under a limited purpose national government, one that recognizes your right to privacy, one that recognizes your right to have most of the governing done at the state and the local level, one that recognizes the right not to live under an emperor who thinks he has every power to legislate under the sun. If we fail to assert those rights, we will find that they've been taken away, and so we have to assert them. So what do we do as a movement to assert those rights? Well, we've been pretty good over the years at identifying problems as they arise. A few decades ago, in 1976, we identified a conservative leader for the ages in Ronald Reagan. We failed to win an election that year, but we still found our leader. We won an election, and we put that conservative leader for the ages in office in 1980. And the difference was we had not only the leader, but we had a conservative agenda. And that's what we need to do today, is find our agenda so that we can install a conservative leader for the ages, and together we can reclaim that which is rightfully ours under our Constitution. <laughs> So a few of us, fortunately a growing number of us, in both houses of Congress are actively, aggressively working to develop a conservative reform agenda, one that replaces our existing outdated Byzantine tax code, one that occupies tens of thousands of pages with something far simpler, with something that undoes uh, very harsh inequities like the marriage tax penalty and the parent tax penalty. We're trying to right-size the federal government generally. We're trying to restore transportation dollars to the states where they properly belong, where states can do more with less with your transportation tax dollars. But we're trying to develop legislation that will put you as a patient back in charge of your own health care, rather than having it outsourced to a Washington bureaucrat. <laughs> We've got ideas that are moving forward. This is helping us unify our party. There is a natural tension that exists between uh, uh, the political base of a party and that party's elected political leadership. That, that, that gap, that gulf right now is evident. And, and the hole inside the Republican Party is, I believe, exactly the size and the shape of a conservative reform agenda. One that embraces conservative principles and puts them into action. One that focuses on our need not only to protest against the kind of national government we don't want, but to embrace the kind of government we do want. I'll leave you with a, a, a thought as to how our Tea Party movement actually started and when it actually started. In a sense, it wasn't five years ago. It was in 1773, when a group of American patriots boarded a ship in Boston Harbor in angry protest against the distant national government that was taxing them too much, that was regulating them oppressively, that was so far from the people in America, not just in geographic terms, but mentally and emotionally as well, that it was slow to respond to their needs, that was governed by a legislative body that recognized no boundaries, no limits on their authority to legislate and to put the people in a position of servitude toward that national government. And so they grasped these crates of English tea, and in symbolic protest against that London-based national government, they threw that tea into the water, destroying it. That was a brave moment, but in and of itself, it, it was inadequate. It was not enough. Had the movement stopped there, 
The Boston Tea Party would have been nothing more than a minor footnote in American history. But they didn't stop there, fortunately for all of us. They pressed forward. And over the next 14 years, they declared, fought for, and won their independence. And 14 years later, in that hot, sweltering, fateful, fortunate summer of 1787, they finally embraced and memorialized in writing the kind of government they did want. And by so doing, they helped foster the development of the greatest civilization, the greatest republic the world has ever known. It's time for us to move beyond our mere Boston moments. We'll continue to have them as this president and this administration continues to abuse author its authority. We will continue to protest against the kind of government, national government we don't want. But it's time for us also to move our eyes and with it our hearts and our hands toward Philadelphia. Together we can build a greater America. Together we can restore the greatness of this republic. Together we can restore the kind of land that God has reserved for us, a land where the sons and daughters of America were meant to live in freedom. May Almighty God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much.